films are instead, as she, as she describes it, mental images that are created and molded in our mind out of subtle matter of the higher psychic plane. Right? That's how she defines it. So it's very different to the Tibetan concept, right? And a lot of the modern Western idea of it comes more from theosophy than it does anything actually Tibetan, right? So on that note, let's actually look at all the theosophy, right? Let's actually look at all uh, our, our, our best of these and thought forms. This is all, this is where stuff gets really interesting, right? So there are some sort of core theosophical ideas that lie behind Besson's teachings that we're going to kind of go over. The first one, and, and actually, thankfully, most of this stuff has now filtered into New Age spirituality, so you will hopefully be familiar with most of it. Number one, which is the like, kind of the grounding of all theosophical concepts, is that thoughts are vibrations, and that thoughts have a kind of resonance to them. That is a theosophy concept, right? Everyone in the New Age now talks about things having resonance, or that kind of thing, right? It's all theosophy. But this is where the concept kind of comes from. It comes from the new thought theosophy movement. The basic assumption, the basic idea I want you to kind of have in your mind here, hold this vibration in your mind, right? Um, is that a thought, when you think about it, and a thought kind of comes into your mind, Besant was under the impression that there are two things that happen, right? Two sort of effects happen when it comes to our thoughts. There is a radiating vibration and a floating thought century so there are, there are thoughts that kind of float through right they sort of come through nonchalantly just kind of float in our minds and there are other thoughts in general that have a kind of resonance and vibration to them and those thoughts vibrate out right and they can affect the world around us they can affect how we perceive the world they can affect how other people perceive the world at the same time as well right so for her every single thought that we have produces those two effects either it will radiate a vibration or it will be this, this kind of floating mass of energy, right? Or this mode floating mass of something. And this is another important point for Besson. And this is the core principle really behind how thought forms work in this sense. Thoughts are not just abstract things. Thoughts to Besson are physical things in the same way you know, that we have physical matter here, physical things. To Besant and the Theosophists, thoughts were physical things as well. They are a kind of matter. There is a kind of spiritual substance, so to speak. Think of it like a liquid or a gas, something like that. There is a spiritual matter that makes thoughts. It's a higher matter. It's a subtle matter, right? A matter that we can't see or feel, at least with physical senses. But our thoughts are a kind of physical matter, that they are a subtle physical matter. So they are a matter from the higher plane, usually the astral, the mental plane, right? But that is, that's that's a core idea to take and run with, that our thoughts have physical components to them. They're not just abstract kind of weird things. They are physical things that have their own matter. And depending on how strong the thought is, depends on how dense it is, right? So if you're thinking about something a lot, and it's a, th a thought that's constantly on your mind, that thought can be described theosophically as being very, very dense and tightly packed with thought matter. If it's kind of a fleeting, you know, something that just crosses your mind quickly, and you forget about it, that in her view would have been a thought that was very loosely packed together. So it didn't have a lot of matter inside of it, it didn't have a lot of substance, right? And that's what we mean when we say not a lot of depth for something. Right. So we still kind of use this idea in colloquialisms and you know general speech. You know, we're saying, oh, well, that, that thought doesn't have a lot of depth to it. People, we describe thoughts as if they are physical things, right? And this is very important for when it comes to dealing with thought forms, right? So as she, she tells us here, right, that when you have a thought, the thought first appears in if, say if you were looking at somebody, right? Let's say you were kind of turned on your energy vision when someone was thinking about something and you kind of looked at a person's aura or their energy field. She says that this is how it happens, right? So when a person first thinks of something, it will appear as a reverberation in the mental body, right? So again, remember back from module three, module four, when we were looking at energy work and on the structure of the bodies, right? You have sort of your general physical body, then you have sort of your prana, then your etheric, then your astral, then your mental body and then emotional body, all these different subtle bodies that sort of line up around your main physical body, right? All the stuff we looked at before. When we have a thought, when we think about something, the first thing that happens is that the mental body, which is just, you know about out here, I guess, on me, you know, so, so I don't know, like a few, I don't know what that is, like 
50, like 30 centimeters or so out from like the main, your main body, something like that, 12 inches, that kind of thing. Um, that's where your mental body roughly is. You know, what happens is when you first have a thought, the mental body first kind of has a little reverberation, a little vibration, right? Something kind of pops out of the mental body and floats there. So imagine every thought is almost like a little sphere, almost. You know, so when you think of something, it creates this tiny little sphere, or this little box of energy, basically, that pops out of your aura and it kind of floats there in your mental body, essentially, right? And she, argue, and she argues basically that the thought, this thought matter, this like little thought bubble that exists, it can either be complex in terms of the geometry, very dense, or if the thought is simple, there's only one rate of vibration, right? And only one type of mental matter will be affected. So say you're thinking of something very simple, or you're not really focusing on it too much, then the geometry of the thought will be very kind of loose and scattered, or it'll be very loose in general. If it's deeper thought, and you're thinking about something a lot and devoting a lot of awareness and a lot of time in your mental body. And this is kind of the, the other aspect to it that we need to talk about, I guess, that everything you perceive in your thoughts is actually just the mental body itself, right? And this is the same with the emotional body. There are, the way she describes it is that there are both ontological and epistemological notions here. So ontological is being, so there is a physical kind of actual, I mean, I use the term physical very loosely here, because it's not physical, but there is an actual defined structure. There is an actual thing itself called the mental body, but there is an epistemological, which is how we know, how we perceive the mental body is through thought. So there is both the faculty of thinking and thinking itself is the sense of our mental body. In the same way that we have five senses in our physical body, thought and our thoughts are the sense of the mental body. Emotions are the sense of the emotional body. Intuition is the sense of the astral body. So every time, in the same way that when you're touching something, right, if I'm touching this water bottle, right, I can feel this with my physical senses, right? So I can see it, it's clear, it's transparent, that kind of thing. But I can also feel it because it's cold, it's water. I can feel touch with my fingers, right? If I lick it and taste it, it tastes like plastic, right? So I'm using all my senses, I can smell it. That's on the physical body. Now, if I sit and I look at this and I think about it and I visualize it in my mind and I'm thinking about what the nature of this bottle is, if, I, if we're speaking platonically, I'm thinking about the form of the bottle, that's me exercising my mental body, right? So now what's happened is the bottle has come into contact with my mental body and my mental body is sensing it in the same way that I'm touching it and feeling it. My mental body is sensing it. And that sensation, when the mental body is touching or tasting or smelling an object or a thing, that translates as a thought in my mind. Now, if I try and feel about this body, this bottle, right? That then means the bottle is coming into my emotional body or my emotional field. So there is both a, a what were the words? There is an epistemological side to this, which is the actual how we know the sensation. But these are also ontological things. There are they are physical things in our energy field that they come across, right? And all these different faculties are how we sense sensations, right? So the way she explains this here is that. When we first, first think about something, a thought first appears in our mental body, right? So thought forms are always created in the mental body because the mental body is the faculty of thinking, right? And they are thought forms. So in the same way, if we were to follow this logic, there are also such a thing as emotional forms as well, um, like as in thought forms essentially that can be created in the emotional body as well, based on emotions there. So, and she says there, when thought form first appears, if the thought is kind of loose and all over the place, it's, it's geometry and its density is very simple. If it's very dense and it's very complicated and we're focusing on it a lot, then it's going to be, a, the geometry is going to be very, very different, right? She says simple thoughts, so like the fleeting whatever thoughts, they have only one rate of vibration, right? So they're only vibrating one thing. And generally only one type of mental matter will be affected. So only one type of thought or one type of influence will be affected, right? The more complex ones, the more denser a thought is, the more aspects of your life and the more aspects of your personality, that kind of thing will be affected, right? It's kind of like very like esoteric spiritual psychology almost. I, I love this stuff, it's really interesting to me. Um, 
So as I said here, right, all of this is based on a basic theosophical understanding that the mental body is essentially composed of matter of different degrees, right? So there is an ontological nature to the mental body that there are degrees of matter and diff different degrees of density, essentially. And we usually arrange in sort of classes according to different subplanes, right? So you have your physical body, you have your pranic body, you have your etheric body, you have your mental body, your emotional body, your astral body, so on, so on, right? All the different layers of your subtle bodies. When we produce a thought form, we are working with the mental layer of our subtle body, essentially, right? And that sort of distinction between different degrees of density in terms of our energy field is what we're talking about here. Now, what she says, and this is very interesting, is that different thoughts are made of different mental matter, okay? All of which, we may come back, there we go. All of which have different rates of vibration, color, and structure. So what she's talking about here is depending on the thought that you have, like depending on its nature, essentially, it will, it will look different and the thought form will behave and be different, essentially, it will behave differently. So a thought of love or joy, for example, is gonna have a different look, feel and geometry to a thought of despair and depression, right? They're gonna look differently when you look at them in someone's aura and they're gonna vibrate differently. They're gonna have a different color. They're gonna have a different shape, different feel, all these kinds of things. The structure in general will just be entirely different, okay? And she actually says, right, so quote, here, when a sudden wave of emotion sweeps over a man of us in general, right? So I'll replace the gender uh, bias language here and so. say, so when a sudden wave of emotion sweeps over us, our astral body is thrown into violent agitation and its original colors are from the time obscured by a flush of carmine, of blue, of scarlet, whatever it is, that corresponds to the rate of vibration of a particular emotion. So what she's saying here is imagine sort of your, your, your natural resting state, right, of your energy is kind of transparent and clear, right? It's like a very neutral pond or, or, or a neutral lake. When an emotional experience comes up, when a passion comes in, right, when an emotional feeling comes in, it disturbs that natural lake, that natural reflective source, and it creates these ripples, essentially. And what ends up happening is that even though our energy is usually clear, and transparent, our energy, especially in the mental and the astral body, gets colored by the emotion that's coming in, right? Now, this is a very important point because the, the way she describes this is very, very similar to how Plato, Plutarch, and Hermes describe emotions, especially in the Hermetica, right? So how Hermes describes emotions. Hermes in the Hermetica describes emotions as these kind of living beings, as kind of passionate demons, almost, who come and attack the soul. Right. And this is why you need to practice things like stoic mindset so you can control and restrain the passions. That's basically what they're talking about here. Right. And this is kind of what she's talking about, where the natural state of the soul is this very calm, very kind of still lake, still water. But when an emotion comes in in the form of a thought form, it comes with its own color and its own vibration, its own density. And it's like someone's throwing a pebble into a pond. Right. And it, 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 it violently disturbs our astral body and our equilibrium. Right. Now, the important thing is, and she will come to this a bit later, is that when an emotion comes in, because it has a certain color and a hue to it, that color then gets transferred into our energy and our astral body. OK. And it kind of creates this like stained window in front of us. So when we're in an emotional experience, we see the world through the lens of that emotional experience right, through the lens of that thought form that comes in, we see the world through that, right, we're not seeing the world or a situation as it truly is, let's take anger as an example, right, so say something happens and a thought form of anger gets produced, that then comes in, let's say the anger is bright red, okay, in the energy, you think about something that makes you angry, that creates a thought form of anger that pops out of your mental body, that then floods into the rest of your energy and your entire energy field is covered with this red field or this red window basically then when you're in that state of agitation and the vibration is sort of amped up right you're then seeing everything through the lens of that anger thought form so every little thing ticks you off right every little thing everyone does ticks you off because 
you're not in your natural state. You're seeing the world and operating through the thought form of anger that has overtaken you, right? And this is really important, right? Because you can imagine if this is happening to us every single time there is an emotional experience, right? Are we ever truly objective? Are we ever actually seeing the world as it truly is or seeing the situation as it truly is? Because we're always looking through the lens of one of our thought forms, okay? This is an important point, very, very important point. Um, Richie says there, when, I'll, I'll repeat it because I just went on the ramble, right? So again, she tells us, quote, when a sudden wave of some emotion sweeps over us, our astral body is thrown into violent agitation and the original colours of it, so our original natural being, for a time, is obscured by a flush of carmine or blue or scarlet red, whatever the colour is that corresponds to the rate of vibration and the colour of the emotion in the astral body, right? I love her. Best is like my favorite. She was also like a major, like one of the early feminists as well. She's like a really cool woman. Uh, but importantly, as she says, right, this is like spiritual psychology, right? She says, this change in color and vibration of our astral body is only temporary, as we know with emotions. The, the filter, a lot of time in a healthy scenario, it will pass in a few seconds or a couple of minutes, right? And our astral body will usually return back to its natural state usually but here we go here's where it gets really interesting this is where the idea of thought forms starts to get a bit dangerous when you're not when you're not aware of them okay she says well he makes a note of saying that every rush or feeling of emotion every outburst that we have every time we give in to an emotion and allow ourselves to view the world through that lens or through that thought form it begins to produce a more and more permanent effect on us in the long run. Every time we allow an emotion in and operate out or operate and see the world from the lens of that emotion, every time we allow a thought form to control us, every emotion and every emanation of that always adds in a little bit of extra energy of its color into our normal coloring of our astral tent of our astral body, right? So in other words, every single time that you give yourself over to a certain emotion, it becomes easier and easier for you to yield to that emotion again, right? Because in her view, the astral body, your natural, clear, translucent state is getting more and more into the habit of vibrating at that special emotional note, right? So imagine it's kind of like emotional frequencies and emotional music notes, essentially. Every time an emotion comes in, if you give into it, the more often that happens, the more times your natural, clear, present lake of an of, an, of, an, of you know tranquil self starts to take on the color and the vibration of that emotion, right? It starts to take on that thought form and it starts to resonate more and more with that thought form until eventually that emotion just becomes your resting natural state. So you just see you're just a naturally angry person all the time, or you're naturally always loved up and in the honeymoon phase, whatever it is, right? Whatever emotion's coming in, the more you give in. To it, the more you start to resonate at that particular emotional frequency, the more common it is that that emotional frequency becomes your resting natural state. And it's because of the thought form, right? Because again, to recap real quick here at the end, your natural state is like a lake. It's a clear lake, right? It's a natural kind of invisible, translucent body. That's your natural divine self. When you think about something, or as we'll come to, somebody else thinks about something strongly enough that it starts to affect you, so you take on their thought form, right? The more you do that, the thought forms start to appear in the astral body and they start to exert influence on you. And if you give in to them and you're not aware of them all the time, then slowly over time, the more you give in to one of those thought forms, the more your physical body and the more your natural divine state starts to resonate with that frequency and you start to just behave that way as, as out of habit right? Like a habitual thing, essentially, you know, uh, it's that kind of idea, essentially, right? Make sure, is that all, all make sense? Here we go, let's have a look. Do, 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 do. Yes, okay, cool, all making sense, wonderful. Cool, so that's the first note. <laughs> so now what she says, and this is with, uh, things get very interesting here, where note, even though we are creating these thought forms all the time, right, she makes a point of saying, we do not have pure thoughts and i mean pure not in the sense of spiritual purity or morality i mean pure as in just singular right whole and complete 
we don't have singular thoughts or emotions, right? Every thought or emotion we have, it very rarely is just one emotion, right? It's, it's a lot of the time, lots of different emotions all tied together and presenting itself as whichever one is the strongest passion, right? Now, what happens in this view is that when we create a thought form from this place, that creates multiple rates of vibration and multiple different thought forms around us. So if I'm angry with you for something, right? I'm not just feeling anger. I'm feeling probably a bit of sorrow and hurt because you probably hurt me. I'm feeling a bit of jealousy. So I'm like, how can you be better at me than hurting me? No, 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 no. I'm feeling, I don't know, other things in general associated with anger, right? In her view, every single one of those little emotions and little thoughts that makes up the feeling of anger will produce its own thought form. So when we feel angry, what's actually happening is we are producing maybe seven or eight different thought forms for each of the respective emotions and thoughts that make up that overarching feeling. Same way with like love, for example. Say when we are in love with somebody and we're all loved up and in the honeymoon phase, right? It's not just love that you're feeling, right? There's a bit of lust in there. If, if there's physical attraction, right? There's a bit of happiness in there because you're happy with being with the person. There's a bit of safety and contentedness in there because you feel comfortable with the person, comfortability in there. All these different things, maybe even a little bit of fear and scarcity in there if you're afraid the person might leave you, right? So when we say, oh, I love you, right? And there's a, you know, you have a feeling of love, you're not just feeling love, you're feeling maybe seven or eight other thoughts and emotions that are going on at the same time, all of which we kind of just use the term love for, right? Instead, what Besson's talking about here is actually when we feel all of those things, each one of those things produces its own thought form, kind of rests in our aura, essentially rests in our energy field and then starts to exert influence on us. So then whichever one you are naturally more drawn to, probably based on past history, past relationships, past behaviors, past habits, that's the one that's going to come through most of all. So, you know, psychologically, this kind of explains why people, you know, go, go people who self-sabotage in relationships, for example, right? This is like where the psychology comes in. And you're like, okay, if somebody is only used to traumatic relationships or going after people who naturally hurt them or abuse them or anything like that, if that's what they're used to, that's the habitual resonance that they're vibrating at in terms of their antibody, when love comes through, they're going to get all the other little thought forms there that make up what they perceive of as love in terms of trauma and everything else. And they're naturally going to gravitate towards that because that's what they're used to and habitually formed through the thought forms of their past. So then that's going to start manifesting in their physical relationship. Right. This is how because we're again degrees of reality, it's all going on here. Right. So there are different thoughts that come in depending on what our overarching feeling is. Okay. And every single one of those little things creates a thought form in our aura. Right. As I said here, right? So when we experience love as an example, right? Love is a really good one because there are so many, like love is a good emotion to talk about because there are so many other things that make up the feeling of love. And we have no vocabulary for anything because we just use the word love for everything, right? So when we experience love, as an example, it's not just love that we're experiencing, right? It's not just love that we're feeling there. It's often tinged with a little bit of pride in ourselves. We're like, oh, hey, I look good. My partner thinks I look really hot. That's great, right? That gives us a bit of pride, a bit of self-worth there. There's a bit of jealousy that comes in there. There's a little bit of lust, if you're physically attracted to the person, right? A little bit of joy, a little bit of ecstasy, all these things when we feel love. Every single one of these thoughts that make up the emotion that we're feeling creates a thought form in our aura that we feel, right? And what this means is in the simple side of things, we go on, on the looser side of it, at least there are, every time we have an emotion or every time we have a thought, because they're not pure, they're not singular, Everything we have can have two different vibrations that are coming off of us at any given time, right? That can appear in the mental astral body, right? So two or more thought forms can often appear. In fact, a lot of times, way more than two, up to like eight, nine, ten, how, however many emotions you're feeling at any given point, right? Each thought or feeling produces its own thought form. And depending on habitually what your energy is more used to in terms of its resonance, that one is going to get stronger. One of those is going to get stronger, depending on which one habitually you're used to essentially right now the radiating vibration of these thoughts is the thoughts are kind of pulsing imagine imagine yeah that's, that's a good way of putting it right imagine you kind of have this natural energy field around you and like when you think of something 
right? Or think of one of these thoughts. It pops out into the mental body and then starts vibrating out waves like ripples across your energy body, essentially. And you can see this, by the way. I, I'm not just making this shit up. You know, if you're if you're looking into energy and you're an energy worker, you can see energy in people. You can kind of see this when it starts to happen. You can actually see like the energy on a person like bumping, all right, going up like this every time it happens. Right? It's really interesting. Um, and again, I, I would encourage you to like go back to like module three and four when we when we were talking about like how to see energy and that kind of thing, and go and get a partner and go and do this. Like ask like get a partner like, or working partner and be like, okay, hey, think about let's do some thoughtful training. Think about this thing, create a thought form of this, and I'm going to see what it looks like, right? And then you can do the same, right? It's a really cool idea, really cool training exercise. But essentially, the the radiating vibration that comes out from these thoughts, it's either going to be complex and heavy. Uh, and in that case, the resulting thought form will show several colors instead of just one, or it will be very, very loose. If it's a singular thought, which is actually very, very rare, believe it or not, the amount of people, regardless of how many people claim they're expert meditators, I promise you, the amount of people who can actually singularly focus their thoughts and attention on one thing is a very, very minimal, right? Almost everybody everywhere sort of creates multiple thought forms, essentially. Now, the other way this can look sometimes, like all the thought forms, they will either appear as separate thought forms, all in your aura, or it will basically appear as just this giant clump of like thought matter or thought energy of different colors and different shapes, all in kind of merged and blended into one, essentially, right? So like, and it will be very dense and very heavy because it's made up of all these like hundreds of different colors and feelings and intention and these kinds of things, right? Now, what ends up happening is that thought forms have a magnetic link to us. They have an energe energetic magnetic link to us. As our thought form kind of sits there, one of two things are going to happen. Either if you feel it and you give into it, it's going to start seeping in through deeper and deeper parts of the astral bodies until eventually it starts to influence you, right? as we just said, or it will start to float the other way and it will start to go away and it will float away from your body and you will no longer feel the thought, but the thought won't have disappeared, right? All those feelings, all those emotions, all those thoughts that you brought up, they didn't disappear. They disappear from your awareness, but they disappear from your awareness because they have moved out of your mental body, right? And they start moving away. So as the thought form starts to move away from you and go out into the world, essentially, it gets less and less powerful the further away it is from you essentially now what's actually really interesting about this is like best like best at heart she really tries to get scientific on this because she, she invokes the inverse square law right so for those of you familiar with physics uh the inverse square law is that basically the amount of energy is, that is dispersed from something when you like throw something out you know throw a baseball or throw something out or beam of light shoots out whatever it is the further away from its source it gets the more energy it will lose and the sort of the equation to determine how much that is is called the inverse square law so like, determine the equation that determines how much energy is lost when something is in movement is the inverse square law and it basically it loses a certain amount every square meter essentially right now she invokes this for the thought form she says oh, okay yeah when the thought form starts leaving your body and leaving your astral body and going out it will lose energy and keep sort of getting weaker and weaker the further away it gets from your body and you go, OK, well, it loses energy at the rate of the inverse square law in physics. But she goes, oh, wait, hold on. We're dealing with another dimension here because we're dealing with the astral dimension. OK, so instead of the inverse square law, let's just say the inverse cube law. So instead of timesing it by two, you times it by three because there's an extra dimension of height. There. And like it's just like the most it's just like the funniest like little bit of like science which rally like it's lovely it's so funny but she uses the inverse cube law to determine how much energy a thought form loses as it moves away from you essentially that's just kind of like basic math you don't need to worry about that just know the basic concept that when your thought form leaves you unless it's fed on something the weaker it gets the further away it is from you essentially that's basically the, what all you need to know with it um now what can happen here, and this is where things get important. And this is where we start getting into the whole idea of thought forms can affect other people. Because imagine that you are, you have created this thought form of anger or love or lust, whatever it is. It's just this like swirling mass of energy in your, in your astral body, right? And then it separates from you. 
and it starts moving out in the world, right? Thought form kind of takes on its own thing and it starts just moving away. That's going to travel through space, right? Travel out through the world, travel out through your environment. Problem is, you are not the only person in your environment. There are other people in there. And other people are also producing their own thought forms too, right? So this is the problem, right? This is the problem that ends up happening where as your thought form travels away from you, it will come into contact with other people. And generally what happens is that when your thought form, especially if it's dense and it's like very heavy and the thought is very disciplined and centered, it knows what it is, right? When a thought form comes into contact with someone else's energy, it will then produce the same thought that it's made of in that other person's mind, right? So it will produce the same essence of itself in another person that it's made of, right? So the thought of the original creator. So say you create a thought form, even unintentionally, of this like huge mass of lust and attraction and passion, right? And then you lose control of it or you forget about it and it starts going out into the world. When that thought form comes across somebody else's energy and, and sort of integrates and passes through their astral body, when it passes through and it touches them, then they are going to get a ton of thoughts about lust and pleasure and all these kinds of things, because that's what the thought form is. It creates a corresponding sort of awareness of the same thought in another person's astral body when it touches it, right? So as it's moving through. This is why we have to be very careful, right? So as your thought form travels, as it moves, when it comes into contact with somebody else, it will create the same thought in that person, essentially. That's why they're called thought forms, right? Now, generally speaking, this is where things get very interesting. Uh, the distance to which the thought form can actually penetrate other people's auras, right? And the force and kind of persistency with which it can do it, and that means affect other people's thoughts and other people's mental body, depends on the strength and the clearness of the original thought right so if it's a very kind of passing loose thought it's just going to kind of come into another person's aura or another person's mental body and it's just going to kind of fade off it's not going to be able to do anything but instead if it's this massively huge dense you know packed heavy thought of depression or lust or whatever it is that's going to come in and it's going to hit another person's mental body like a truck Right, like a huge, like it's, like, it's gonna be like someone's like throwing a curveball, like a baseball at you, at like sixty miles an hour. Right, it's gonna like puncture the mental body of another person. Right, when it when they when they come into contact with it. So it depends on like the degree to which your thought form can influence another person. It depends on the quality in terms of strength and the clearness of your original thought. So in other words, how dense and heavy the thought is when it starts interacting with somebody else. Right, that's the big thing. Now, there is actually a very good analogy that she uses with this, right? Because she basically goes on and she talks about, she likens this to like somebody who's speaking. Like say someone's on a podium and they're sort of speaking out, right? She she uses the, the, that example, right? She says, you know, when you speak, when I'm speaking right now, right? You can obviously hear me through your speakers, right? Or whatever it is, right? Because I'm speaking to my microphone. If we are in person, right? And I am sort of speaking on stage or on a podium, the sound waves of my voice kind of protrude out from my voice, right? As I'm speaking, I'm sending out sound waves to you. And if we're in person, your ears are picking up those vibrations and they're there. But obviously if you're further away and I speak really, really softly and you can't hear me, then my words are not gonna be impactful to you at all, right? In the same way, we can kind of argue the same thing with thought forms, right? Depending on, how close you are and how well you enunciate your words in a speech depends how many people can understand and receive you, right? So when you're speaking, depending on how well I enunciate my words and depending how loud I speak and how purposefully I speak will depend on how much you receive and how much influence I have over you, right? Now, it's the same thing with thought forms there, where in this case, if, you know, if you're far away from me and my thoughts aren't disciplined or they're, um, they're not enunciated, right? They're going to have a very smart, they're going to have a very minor impact on you. But if I sit there and I really deeply focus on you, you know, and I really concretely you know, get this thought into be very, very dense, very, very powerful, very, very heavy, and then I send it off to you, that's going to have a much more powerful impact on you, right? Because it's coming into your actual body, essentially. Now, 
Um, the other thing that she mentions here is about the, the mental body in itself, where she says, if somebody is engrossed in another deep thing or is doing something else that is occupying their mental body, a thought form will sometimes pass over them because the mental body is much more defined and focused on the task. So in the same way that your thought forms can be very dense or very loose, your mental body can also be very dense or very loose, depending on how much you're focusing on something. So for example, say you're doing some magic and you're sending a thought form to me um, to, I don't know, I don't know, say, say you have a crush on me, for example, right? Because I know I'm very attractive. Uh, <laughs> but And you're sending a thought form of lust or whatever uh, to me, right? To try and get me to like talk to you a bit more. Say I'm like completely focused on my work and I'm like, my mental body is super dense and super aware of only my work. And I'm not even aware of what's going on outside of me. Your thought form is going to have no effect, right? Because it's going to try and hit my mental body and it's going to bounce off because my mental body at that point, because I'm so focused on something, it becomes dense. It becomes like a brick wall. But if I'm much more relaxed and I'm not focusing on anything and my mental body is just very, very loose, right? It's very, very divided because I'm not focused and I'm not using it then your thought form is going to have much more influence on me, right? Because it's not focused on the task. When we are focused on tasks and we have sort of concrete awareness of something that are, is deeply kind of rooted on one thing, our mental body gets stronger. It gets thicker, it gets denser, and it becomes harder to manipulate or harder to use, essentially, because it's focused so intently on that one thing, essentially, right? It's very, uh, very important to understand that. And also bear in mind, that's also a way to protect yourself from other people's thought forms. Bear in mind. So if you strengthen your mental body, you strengthen your defense against other people's thought forms and influence. Now, important. Now, this is very, very important when it comes to understanding how thought forms influence people. Right. During its influence, when a thought form begins to influence somebody, it does, and this is important, so if you're making notes, note this down and like memorize it, it's really important. When your thought forms are influencing people, they do not not convey the subject of thought, they convey the character of thought. Here's what I mean, right? So when a thought form is influencing us, they convey the character and the nature of the thought, not the subject of the thought. Besson, she uses a really good example of a Hindu here, right? She uses an in, a Hindu person sitting in meditation devoted to Krishna, right? So the Hindu god Krishna, right? So imagine a person is sitting in meditation and, and, and they're Hindu, right? So they believe in Krishna, or the Hindu gods, and they are focused entirely on devotion and love to, to Krishna, right? So in their in their astral body, essentially, they are creating a thought form of love and religious devotion to, in their mind, Krishna. But the astral and the energy doesn't care about the, the actual subject itself. It cares about the fact that it's a devotional and loving thought, right? So it creates a love thought form. It doesn't create a love form of Shiva. The subject, whatever it is that's causing that love and devotion, doesn't matter. When it, as far as the thoughtful is concerned, it's the character, it's the nature of the thought, right? So when a Hindu is sitting and meditating on Krishna, and they're in this kind of state of divine love, they may be feeling it for Krishna, right? But the thought form that's created is just one of divine love. It's one of divine reverence, right? So in theory, when that thought form starts to move out, and it starts to move across, right, the waves of feeling and emotion that pour out is that devotional feeling. Right. And in everyone that it comes across, every everyone that, that thought form then begins to influence, it creates the feeling and the thought of devotion, not of devotion to Krishna. Right. Because the actual core thought is of religious devotion. Right. So in Besson's example, if this Hindu person is creating a thought form through their devotional love and that thought form then starts to emanate out and starts to come across other people. Right. If that thought form of devotional love came across a Muslim for example, they would instead, it would arouse a thought of devotion to Allah, right? If it came across as a Rastrian, it would arouse a feeling of love and devotion to Ahura Mazda. If it came across a, a, a Christian, it would arouse feelings and thoughts of Jesus, not Krishna, right? So it doesn't matter 
that the original thought is on Krishna. It's just the character of the thought, not the subject. So when you start to emanate out of thought form, and this is this is really good to bear in mind when you're creating your thought forms, right? It's very, very difficult to make a thought form super specific to like make it towards a certain subject. Instead, you are arousing feelings that are or, or thoughts of the same character with your thought thoughts, essentially, right? So when a person is affected by a thought form, it naturally, when it seeps in to the other person's aura or the other person's energy on their mind, it acts in accordance with and resonates or it creates a corresponding sort of arousal of any kind of already habituated vibrations of a similar character, you know, uh, in, in their mental body, essentially, right? So it, it basically it uses whatever is currently going on in your own body, in your own life, and it stimulates those feelings. And then the subject becomes whatever it is that you're focused on, right? So you don't, you know, if a Hindu is emanating out this thought form of Shiva or Krishna, you know, and then you come into contact with it, you won't suddenly become a devotee of Krishna, right? If you are a Christian, that thought form of love will instead arouse devotion to Jesus, because that's the subject that you're directed towards, right? Now, one thing that's actually really, really interesting, um, which I think is really cool, uh, is that Besant touches on like atheists, where it's like, okay, well, hold on. What will happen if like an atheist comes into this, comes into contact with like a thought form of divine love? Like what will happen? And she says, oh, well, a thought form of divine devotion, it will awaken the faculty of higher divine thinking in somebody who doesn't believe in it, right? Because theoretically, it hasn't become accustomed to them to focus on divinity yet. You know, because they kind of deny divinity, somebody who's an atheist, if they come into contact with a thought form that is of religious devotion, it will awaken those kind of higher qualities and higher aspects in that person in and of itself. Right. So this is actually a really interesting thing because she argues, and I actually agree with this, it's pretty interesting. If we take this assumption that thought forms are constantly emanating out, right? She says every single person in the world, and this includes you, right? Every person who is sitting in meditation and devotes themselves to spiritual work and spiritual thinking, and in turn emanate your own thought forms of divine love and divine, you know, reverence, that kind of thing, all of that is inspiring spiritual feelings and contemplation of the divine in other people. And therefore you are doing missionary work by sitting in meditation and emanating out your thought forms of pure reverence and pure love all those thought forms are emanating out into the world and other people are coming across them and they are being inspired to divine love, right? So in a way, you are doing missionary work by, by creating these thought forms and sending them out, right? So it's very, very fun. So all of you are theosophical missionaries if you're creating these thought forms, which I think is very fun, right? Um, so then as we looked at last week, she also eventually adds in this idea of elementals to her thought forms. He kind of shifts it up a little bit, right? Where she says that when we create thought forms, the thought itself, because the thought is a kind of matter, right? It's a kind of actual substance in and of itself. It serves as a body for astral entities, especially elementals in this sense, right? So elementals are these kind of vital essences and these consciousnesses that exist on the astral plane, right? Or, or in the astral world, essentially, in the spirit world of any kind of capacity. Um, and eventually what ends up happening is if a thought that you create, right? So say a thought of love that you create there is dense enough, it's solid enough, it's powerful enough, it can arise from that disciplined awareness. An elemental that sort of corresponds roughly to the feeling can then inhabit that thought, Right, it can inhabit that thought form and it kind of serves the role of its soul and it then therefore then makes the thought form alive, right? Because the elemental then uses the thought form as its body, essentially, right? So the matter of the thought sort of clothes the elemental there and it then becomes, your thought form then becomes an autonomous creature with its own identity and it then behaves like a spirit. So in a way, and this is where a lot of the chaos magicians and everything go kind of wrong with this, you're not actually creating a, a creating a spirit when you create an equical or a thought form. They are not spirits. Here's the thing. They may behave like spirits, 
but thought forms and egregores are not spirits. They are not. They are the bodies of already existing consciousnesses that are out there, right? So a spirit, an elemental, whatever it is, could be floating around with no body as a loosely defined consciousness, but when it sees your thought kind of floating out there in the world, it can see it and it can go, oh, okay, cool. That's dense enough and solid enough for me to inhabit. So then it can move down a layer in terms of the degrees of reality, right? Move down a dimension and it can inhabit that thought and then mold it to be its body, right? So you are not this, and that, and that in itself is what brings it to life. So you are not really creating the spirits. You're creating thoughts that are bodies that attract spirits that you actually want to work with, right? So like a love thought form will attract an elemental that embodies Venusian qualities, for example, right? Or if you're create if you're deeply focused on mercurial things, for example, and this is where we're adding in some of the classical magic, right? If you're deeply focused on learning and mercurial things and all this kind of stuff, right? The th that will create a thought. And that thought will resonate at sort of the frequency of mercury, essentially. Then a mercurial spirit or consciousness that is kind of floating around in one of the spheres will then at some point see that thought and feel drawn to it because it's of the same essence. And it can then inhabit that thought and then can become alive, right? The thought then becomes the thought form, then becomes a sentient being because it contains a consciousness of the spirit, right? And because the thought form is linked to you, because the matter has come from you, the spirit is then beholden to you, right? You can kind of control it and work with it because it, its body is basically like in the same, the analogy I would use is in the same way that the Zodiac acts as fate for us, right? So it controls our body. Because we create the body of the thought form, we act as the Zodiac for the thought form we can control its fate, in the, if that kind of makes sense, right? In the same way that the Zodiac controls our fate when we incarnate into a body, because we create the body of the thought form, we kind of serve the role of fate for the thought form, so we can direct it, right? Even though the consciousness is itself a being, right? We can command it and do its thing because we create the body of it, right? It, it's our thought, essentially. Hopefully that will make sense. Um, but it's a very kind of interesting, huge thing. Um, when you get into it right but i think it's uh it's somewhere i see a, a lot of people going wrong um when it comes to thought forms because people are people are like oh i can create my own spirits no not really you can create the body for spirits that is the vessel absolutely because that's what your thought is right but the consciousness in of itself comes from outside it comes and inhabits the thought form that you have created essentially right and when it does, it then takes on its own identity and its own being, at least as far as Besson is concerned, right? How are we doing with time? Cool, almost there. Um, now, usually when we're dealing with thought forms, two things will happen, as we said. Either they will seep in through your body and they will affect you, right? So your thought forms will either, there are like two directions a thought form can go. Either they will go inwards, if you're thinking about yourself, right, and which most of us usually are, we are usually like 90% of our thoughts are about ourselves, right? So if you're thinking about yourself, your thought forms will appear and they will come inwards, or they can be directed towards other people, right? So you can send a thought form to another person, i.e. if you're concentrating on them while you're thinking about that thing, right? Now, if a thought form is created with somebody else in mind, it will naturally gravitate towards that person's mental body, right? This is kind of what Besson argues with it. Right? It's like there, when you create a thought form with a specific person in mind, it will naturally move because it has a kind of a natural connection to that person, right? And it will then naturally expand its energy on them, right? If we create one for ourselves, usually by mistake, right? Because we think about ourselves too much, it tends to just kind of linger in our auric field, right? It just kind of tends to just sit there and just be there, essentially. But things get a bit tricky when we look at this, right? Because she claims that the influence of a thought form is often dampened, as I said, by the exercise of the mental body, right? So 
if you are engaged in other tasks or activities, i.e. you are creating more thought forms that are at the forefront of your awareness, the thought forms that you create as a result of being focused on one task act as a kind of shield around your energy that prevents outside thought form from coming in, essentially. So we will likely not feel an older thought form that's active. Now, this is a really interesting point, right? Say you have created a thought form or thought form from habitual thinking patterns, and it's an old thought form that's lingering in your energy, right? When you go about your daily life and you're focused on something, you are not going to feel it as much because it's, it's in the back end of your energy, right? Now, however, there are times, or, or like when you're focused on something in your day-to-day -day life, your mental body is very dense. It's very focused. So any older thought forms that you may have created are not going to be able to affect you as much, right? Because they're at the back deep end of your energy there. And when your mental body is dense, it's not going to be able to access your immediate consciousness. So you're not going to be immediately aware of it, right? But we are not always in a state of focus, right? When the mental body is relaxed, instead, when we are resting, when we are having a quiet day, we're having a moment, maybe we're in bed, you know, we're alone with our thoughts, right? Brings a whole new meaning to the phrase, we're alone with your thoughts, right? Yes, you are alone with these beings in these entities that are sitting in your aura, right? You are alone with your thoughts there. When you have a quiet day and a quiet moment and your mental body is relaxed, all those older thought forms that have been lingering in the depths of your energy field start to come back, right? They start to have more influence because your mental body isn't as thick, so you can't ignore them, right? So we could be talking, people can hold on to thought, hold on to thought forms for 10, 20 years, right? If the root isn't addressed and the thought forms just lingering there, especially, especially if you've gone through traumas or you've gone through issues or any of these kinds of things, right? Or you've had repeating beliefs, all these kinds of things, it can create a little thought form that acts as a kind of a parasite, essentially, that sits right at the back of your energy that you're not consciously aware of until the time where you're relaxed and you're alone, right? When you're relaxed and you have nothing else to think about, there are no other thought forms coming up in your mind, right? Your mental body's relaxed, so it's more influential or it's more easily influenced. Then all those old thought forms start coming back and you get haunted by past experiences. You get haunted by past visions or past thoughts, essentially, right? Now, people without knowledge of this happening, right? People who don't understand that this is the way the energy works, essentially all the way thought forms work, they may often interpret this as, oh my God, I'm under attack by a demon. I'm having visions. I'm, I'm having all these things. What's going on with me? Oh, blah, blah, blah. They'll think spirits are attacking them or spirits are kind of sending them visions or they're seeing certain things, right? When they're alone. In reality, it's actually just your own thought forms from your past exerting influence on you because you are in a more receptive state to them, right? You're in a relaxed state. The mental body is weaker because you're not focused on things. So all of those old thought forms are coming back up and they're around you again. And because they're coming more into your main front of awareness, you're reliving past memories and past thoughts, essentially, right? Now, if a thought form is not personal, and it's not directed at somebody, right? So they're kind of the two ways. It kind of just ends up becoming detached, right? And just kind of floating off into the atmosphere somewhere. So either if you think about yourself, the thought form will be reflected on you. If you think about another person, it will be sent directly to them. Uh, but if, it, if you don't do either, and you're just kind of absent-mindedly creating stuff, if you're just contemplating whatever it is, then your thought forms will just naturally detach from your aura and they will kind of just float away essentially, right? They'll float around in the atmosphere and they will emanate out all of the original thoughts of their creator, right? Until it's energy, until it basically exhausts its energy and it just dissipates and goes poof, right? It just fades out, essentially. Unless it attaches to someone else's a mental body, right? So your thought form can just kind of float away, essentially, right? And just kind of sit there over the other side of the room in the house, whatever it is, and just it, it will just be spitting out that original thought, right? Whatever it is, it will just be spinning it out unless, and it will just keep doing that until it runs out of energy, whatever energy was stored up, unless it shoots out and it then attaches to another person's mental body, right? 
But here's the caveat. A thought form like that, it can only attach itself to your mental body if it stirs up enough of the same vibration and character of thought in that person's mental body. So here's what we'll do. It will go in, and again, think of that example of the tuning fork when you hit it and the other one resonates, right? It will start moving. It will, the thought will come into the other person's energy. Let's say, let, let's say you're coming across another person's thought form, right? What will happen is the person's thought form will come into your energy and it will start ringing and pulsing like a bell, right? And it will let out a certain frequency. And depending on how dense your mental body is and how up, how many other thought forms and things you have going for you at any particular time, right? It will either eventually, through that resonance, it will create a corresponding tone and frequency that will then create a thought form of the same thought. And that will then be a pathway in there or it won't, and it will fade away and it won't do anything, right? So the only way that somebody else's thought form can affect you is if it can produce the same thought in you, right? So it will come across your energy, essentially, start pulsing at the frequency and the resonance of its thought, and that pulsing, like a tuning fork, will produce a, the same tone and the same thought in your energy body. And if it does, then it can have a way in. But if you're aware of it and it and you know how to stop it, it doesn't, then it can fade out and you won't be affected by other people's thoughts and feelings, right? It's like empath training again, right? It's kind of how it works, essentially. At least that's how she describes it, right? Now, as she says, how are we doing for time? I'm not sure what going like 10, 20, 20 minutes, half an hour, cool. We'll be good time. So she says, when, when we are creating thought forms, essentially, there are three principles that underlie the creation of all thought forms. And don't worry, like next week, week after, we're going to get into the actual step-by-step -step of creating very, very dense ones, like intentionally, because these things can also be very, very useful if you're doing it intentionally. Right? But there are three principles to bear in mind when it comes to creating thought forms, right? And these, th these three things determine the nature and the strength of the thought form, right? Number one, the quality of thought, that is the nature of the thought, whether it's love, whether it's it's depression, whether it's sadness, joy, whatever it is, right? The quality of the thought determines the color, right? So the color of the cloud, the color of the ball, the color of the skin, if it's a person, right? The quality and the nature of the thought that you're having determines the color of the thought form. Number two, the nature determines the form. So again, sort of similar, the quality is kind of, I guess, how would how we define the difference? Quality is kind of like the rate of vibration, I guess, or like it's this, it's the distinction between happiness and joy, right? They're both kind of the same emotion, but joy is like a little bit above happiness. It's like a cut above, it's like more ecstatic, right? That's kind of the quality and that turns the color. So like, for example, a happiness thought form may be yellow or bright, but ecstasy and pure joy may be bright shining gold. Right, they're very similar colors, but the quality of the emotion is different. The nature of the thought determines the form. So, whatever it is there, whether it's sadness, joy, happiness, whatever it is, that will determine what the thought form looks like. Turns what form, which ge what geometry it takes, essentially. And finally, the third one, the definiteness and clearness of the thought. So, how much discipline uh thought you have right how clear the thought is is what determines how clear the outline of the thought form is right so how like opaque or how translucent it looks so if you look at someone in uh, someone's thought form it will be like kind of like shimmering kind of you can see through it you know like translucent kind of thing or transparent so I'm looking for um but the degree sort of how much you can see through how faded and ghostly the thought form is, is determined by how definite your thought is. So how focused your mind is on that thought, essentially, right? So that's the main, that, that's the main top three things, right? Quality, nature, and definiteness. Quality determines the color, nature determines the form, and definiteness, so that's awareness and focus, determines the transparency of it and how dense it is. So obviously you can see, where if somebody is like very, very deeply focusing on something, then it will become more and more physical and it will be less ghostly in appearance. So you may even begin to physically see it, right? Um, now, in their book, 
like we said, we were looking at the book and you have this book for homework to read. And this is actually where I'm getting it all from, by the way, if you guys want to go and check the source on this uh, and you will have the homework and you will have this book to go through on your own time, the homework as well. Um, but for, uh, in the book, Best and Levita, they basically def they define thought forms in terms of three different classes. Right? They divide thought forms rather into three different classes. So these are the three types of thought forms that supposedly exist, according to them. Right? There are human image forms, and these are thought forms that take the image of the person making them. Right? So I can create a thought form that looks like myself. It looks like a mental projection of myself, like a ghostly, shadowy version of myself. Right. Uh, and the example that she gives here or, or, or Annie gives is essentially kind of similar to astral projection, basically. Right. Where she goes, when a man thinks of himself as if he's in some distant place or he wishes to be there. So say I close my eyes and I visualize myself in Egypt, at the Great Pyramids, for example, and in her view, I create a thought form in my imagination and my visualization in my own image who appears there. So in, th in theory, a clairvoyant or a psychic who is standing by the pyramids, if I was to sit down in meditation, you know, get very, very centered and focused and make myself go to the pyramids and visualize myself there, I am creating a thought form in the shape of myself that theoretically could then be seen by a clairvoyant or a psychic there. It's kind of, it's basically like mental projection, essentially, right? Um, and equally, when these forms appear on the astral, right, they will generally look like you, right? So when you're kind of looking around, you're seeing shadowy ghost figures, essentially. They are kind of you, essentially, right? And they are the first type of thought form. The next type of thought form are object forms. So these are thought forms, essentially, that take the image of some material object. So say I'm thinking of a light bulb or a spoon or, I don't know, a bit of, I don't know, a stick I guess, any, any random object, essentially, right? Um, she explains, a painter, like this is the example she gives, right? A painter who forms a conception uh, of his future painting, builds it out of the matter of his mental body, and then projects it onto the space in front of him and keeps it in his mind eye and then copies it. So, right, so when you're drawing a picture, right, or if I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, say I'm, I'm building my website right? or I'm building these slides, even to use a very practical example. I'm sitting there in my mind where I'm creating these slides. I'm like, okay, yeah, I can see all of the text. I can see the image I want and I can see the animations that are coming out. All of that I'm creating is a thought form, essentially. Right. So again, she's using that example, like when someone's drawing a picture or painting a picture, first thing first, the artist or the drawer will see the image they want to create in their mind and then project it onto the page and then they will kind of shade in and follow the image in their mind right so she's saying they are projecting a thought form of the object of which they're creating essentially right she goes equally the novelist in the same way builds images of his characters in mental matter first and by the exercise of his will he moves these puppets from one position or grouping to another so that the entire plot of his story is acted out. So when you're writing a novel, right, or you're writing something and you're visualizing the scenes, you can see the scenes playing out before you as you're writing them, right? Or at least a good writer can, at least, right? So she says that's another kind of thought form. And then the last type of thought form, she says, is that is abstract forms. And abstract forms are thought forms that have no definable shape. They're just kind of random masses of energy and clumps of clouds, basically. Uh, and they appear as manifestations of abstract concepts, essentially. Right? So she says, these forms may either express their inherent qualities in the matter from which they draw around them, and they are most usually the truest form of thought forms, right? as they are the shape of the thought or emotion itself, rather than being moulded into a different shape during the creation process. So abstract thought form are the most common types that she talks about in her work. Right. Because again, she's arguing here, this is this is what thought and emotion really looks like. Right. So when we start to create a thought form, usually we filter the emotion through the ego and we impose a kind of a will or a shape or a structure on it rather than the actual emotion itself. Uh, so here she says abstract forms, they take the, the truest form of the thought of the emotion. Right. And then, you know, that's kind of just how they work. But that's the three types. Right. So human forms object forms and abstract forms there um it's it's, it's kind of that interesting cool idea right very very fun so 
Here are some examples, right? I said earlier, uh, I found from a Besant's original paintings, right? So this is essentially how these how these came about is in her book with the other theosophists, she did a whole series of experiments where different people who are, you know, the double blind, this is basically like a double blind study where people who didn't know each other or whatever sat down and created thought forms and then she got an artist basically to draw uh, or she got a psychic or a clairvoyant person in who claimed to be able to see energy and see thought forms and then got them to describe what the thought form looked like when they were looking at the person's energy and then the psychic dictated to an artist or a painter or even her I think so they dictated that Annie and I think Annie drew this herself uh, what the thought form looked like right so this thought form which looks kind of like a fun squiggly snake uh, is a thought form with the intention of knowledge right so if somebody was thinking about knowledge or knowing which I think is absolutely hilarious especially if you like to me it was it like resembles the Kadikas right it's like the staff of Hermes which I think is like the serpent of knowledge which I think is just absolutely hilarious so there's like some kind of inherent like mystery in this but there you go that the thought form of knowledge it looks like a kind of a snake which is just kind of funny um, but that is what uh, a, a thought form with the intention of knowing looks like or knowledge looks like uh, here is a thought form that, uh, with the intention or thought of fright or fear. All right. So like almost like when you look at these, it kind of arouses a similar thought in you. Right. So if you look at them, why, you know what, you know what I should have done actually now that I'm thinking about this, um, I see it's creating a thought from my mind right now. It's like, I should have just put these up without the captions and seen if like, you see like what other thoughts and emotions like come up in you when you look at these. That's really fun. <laughs> that's one of um that's what fear looks like as a thought form right so imagine these kind of like floating around in your energy essentially uh this is anger and rage which seems fairly on point right so when someone's angry this is kind of what it looks like in their energy field uh and then this which i thought was really really interesting is and this is like a big experiment they did is they went to a church and they looked at the kind of the religious devotion well, they looked at the energy around a church during a mass, basically, like when, when all the church organs are playing uh, or, or people are singing hymns and religious devotional songs to God in mass. Right. And this is what they saw right, around the church, supposedly, like all this is what they painted. Um, and there's a better image on the next page, actually, I think, or, or a couple of pages from now. Um, and they actually define this as, a, as another kind of thought form. We'll get to that in a second. Right. It's always very, very fun. Now, to help in understanding this a little bit more, they actually further divide thought form classes into kind of different kinds of thought matter and make them up, right? So the first kind of thought form are emotional thought forms, right? As I was saying earlier. So these are thought forms that are kind of created based in the emotional body rather than the mental body. And these thought forms are based on emotional experiences that you've had, right? So they're not based on thoughts, they're based on feelings, that you've had and they become stronger depending on how much emotion and attention you give to them so the more intensely you feel an emotion the bigger and more powerful that thought form gets in your emotional body right and their initial strength the thing that brings them into creation essentially is dictated by the strength of the original emotional situation right um and this is kind of what uh, this is one of the examples they use, right? So she she drew this picture and said this is, is a thought form of somebody who has a strong personal craving or a, a strong craving for possession and control. So somebody who's very possessive, right? Somebody who maybe has a bit of trauma around letting things go. This is kind of like like it's kind of interesting because you can see it kind of like hooks and claws. Like this is kind of like what it looks like in the energy, essentially, right? Where like somebody who's possessive creates this in their emotional. Uh, in their emotional body and then sort of sends that out to the person or the thing they're possessive of right so it kind of claws them in almost there uh, and she says in this way when you create an emotional thought form like this thought forms like rage and fear and anguish they may arise shortly after an argument comes so say if you have an argument with a lover Right, or an argument with your parents or an argument with a friend or something like that, it will create temporary thought forms or like not very long lasting thought forms of anger, of fear, of anguish, whatever it is. And she describes them, as you can see here, as kind of the distinctive features of these kinds of thought forms are that they have very kind of curving hooks. They're very, they have very sharp, defined edges. And, you know, you, you can see on the right, right? It's kind of what it looks like. So the, like the, the main things that 
characterize these kind of emotional thought forms of anger and um loss and, and anxiety all these kind of things is they have very kind of sharp edges and they look kind of hooking right so they kind of hook you and scrape you essentially and that's actually kind of how anxiety feels if you, you, know, you, you those of you who have had anxiety you know how it feels right it feels like something clawing you back or hooking you in right it's kind of how it feels and, and that's how they conceptualize it uh she says another kind of thought form that's made is the experiential thought form and these are masses of thought that are created from experiences that we might go through in life. So obviously there is a big overlap here between emotions and experiences because experiences will oftentimes create emotions, right, that we go through. But they are largely instructive at showing us how different people are affected by sudden and serious situations, right? So she, as she, she even acknowledges it herself. She says, you know, these may, experiential thought forms may cross over uh, with emotional thought forms because experience usually comes comes accompanied by emotional reactions but experiential thought forms are generally much more fluid in their nature and they resemble more like object image forms rather than these kind of abstract forms right so they're generally and you'll see another example in a second they're generally produced from experiences in life rather than straight emotions per se right so on the right we have a really a really fun example here right um, so here, this first image, which is the kind of a thought form in someone's aura, uh, both of these thought forms were created at a funeral, believe it or not. So they both represent different different perspectives on grief, right? Um, and they they understand they are different, and I guess expressions of grief at a funeral, right? So the first image here, it shows a full expression of deep sympathy, right? This one on the right, on the, on the left, rather, that looks like kind of like a little funky wizard's hat with stars, right? Or like a pyramid shooting up, right? So, so she says, the light green color here at the bottom, it shows understanding of the suffering of the deceased's relatives and condolence with them. The strip of deeper green shooting up the middle here shows the attitude of the thinker towards the dead man himself. Right. So green is green is something associated with either nature or kind of contentedness. Sometimes if it's like a limey green, it's almost jealousy sometimes as well. Uh, the second image on the right hand side is the more depressive side of a funeral, so the more depressive thought reaction to a funeral. Right. And it's made manifest. The general image, you know, when you look at this, you can kind of see it indicates a sense of personal loss and despair. You know, again, we've got that distinctive hook there which is like kind of loss of possession there and also it's like a bit more cloudy in general right it's a bit more dull what kind of thing which is very fun um so that's that right which i think look really really cool and it shows a mixture of mourning and celebration which shows the different thought and emotional reactions to grief right which i think is really really cool um and it's like a way it's almost like a way of getting people to draw their emotions almost or draw their thoughts which i think is really really cool right so then the other uh, common types. So these are like your object image forms, your emotional forms, right? So the other uh, form that can be created, the other kind of thought form is what she calls the meditative thought form. And these are essentially thought forms or masses of thought that, in my eyes at least, most commonly resemble the tulpa. So these are the closest things in philosophy that resemble the Tibetan tulpa, right? Because they are created through focused intention during meditation. Right. So when you are sitting in meditation, you are very relaxed, or very focused on a particular thought. It will create a distinctive kind of thought form from that meditative trance, essentially. You know, um, the, the, the... oh, this is on oh, no, this is on the next slide. So I'll show you an image on the next slide, actually. No, I don't know why I put it on the next slide. But the image that you'll see in a second uh, was generated by a man who was trying, essentially, while sitting in meditation to fill up his mind with an aspiration or a feeling to enfold all people together into kind of a unified consciousness, essentially, right? Um, and these kinds of meditation thought forms are the most intentional and they have the most usability in magic, right? Because they can be programmed and constructed for, for specific purposes. And these are the ones that we're going to focus on. So next week, week after, um, or whenever it is we get to the actual methodology, we are going to be focusing on these thought forms here, making like how to make these, right? So when we say, when we go into ritual meditation, we are going to teach you how to create meditative thought forms, essentially, because they are the easiest to program, right? All of these other ones, they can be produced um, 
naturally or without effort. Meditative pro uh, thought forms, as you can see here, and this is the example, right? So this is the thought form supposedly of a person sitting in meditation, thinking about or creating a thought form of sort of universal consciousness, universal kind of um, godly love, essentially, right? That's kind of what it looks like. So we are going to be creating these in like the next two weeks, three weeks, essentially, right? And we're going to show you how to create them because these are the most intentional ones that have the most usability when it comes to ritual and magic, right? Uh, and we do 29, almost done. Cool, okay. Uh, actually, we're finishing right on time. This is the last slide. So as I said uh, before, we had that really interesting one here, right? This is a much better image where I said earlier that uh, one of the other major experiments uh, that the Theosophists did is they went to a church during mass, right? Or during a Eucharist uh, or during a general church service. I can't, remember who, I can't remember if it was a Eucharist exactly, but they went during a church service when people were singing hymns of religious devotion, essentially. And this is how they described it, right? So when they looked at the thought form that was created by a hundred people collectively, so this is actually more of an equitable, actually. So it was created by a hundred or so people in mass, sort of emanating out of religious devotion, essentially. And this is what it looked like, right? So they painted the image of what they saw there. It's kind of like this beautiful enfolding. And you can see loads of different colors, loads of different shapes, all these kinds of things, right? Because there are different people there. Now, they actually say, and this is, I, I, I slightly disagree with them here, um, but they actually say this in, in itself, this is a different kind of thought form. So they give this another, they, they sort this into a different category, right? So they add an extra category on, and they say that thought forms can be created by sound, specifically music, right? Because they say, um that the thought form when it like a thought form can be created in response to certain frequencies and melodies all these kinds of things right so rather than you thinking and and the thought being or the thought form being created from your own thoughts if you put music on then a thought form can be created from music from the certain frequencies and the certain notes and things and the relationship between the notes and the resonance it can be created inside of a inside of music right it can be created from music which is why we are emotionally moved by music right in their view when we listen to a song and a song brings us to tears or it, it makes us very happy and we have different emotional reactions or thoughts to songs right the reason that happens the reason music moves us is because music creates a thought form that then creates a corresponding thought form in our mental body or our emotional body right now for me I don't necessarily agree with this. I can totally see the benefit of it. And I can totally, totally see it being a thing. Like I don't object to like the concept of it. Um, but for me, it, it just kind of, I, I I kind of just don't see the point in making that a separate category, you know, because the, the music thought form, it's going to create a thought form in your emotional body anyway, or your thought anyway, your mental body anyway. So it's basically just a regular object form, right? So I would like this, I would just get rid of this category and I would just like put it in the other one. I feel like so. I would I acknowledge music can create thought forms, but I would just say like the thought form it creates is basically just an object form, right? It, it's just a regular thought form rather than a separate category. Um, and the the thought form oftentimes originates from the emotions and the intentions of the people composing the music, not necessarily the music itself, right? So like this is where I would differ. Where, where they argue that. The thought there is a thought form can be created from the music itself, from the actual notes and the melodies and how they come together. I might disagree, and I might say actually the music itself is a thought form of the writer or the composer. And then when we listen to the music, we like I don't know it creates a like that thought form that is the music creates a corresponding feeling in us that is the the writer's or the composer's intention. Right. So we are communicating with the thought form of the composer, not necessarily the music. But that would be my opinion. You know? But you are entirely entitled to have your own one. If you if you listen to your music and think, yeah, this is a creating thought form. That's totally fine. You know, you can even experiment with it, that kind of thing. Um, so in my mind, in, in their mind, where when they use this example, they said that the choir music. Right. So when they went to a church, they said the choir music created this thought form. Right. I would argue the thought form was created by the choir not the music, right? Because all the choir members are focused on the same intention. They're focused on the same thing, which is divine reverence, usually, or, or getting the song right, or that kind of thing, right? 
And that intention and that thought form is then embodied into the song they sing and the music they play, which then creates thought form and it causes it to be shaped in that kind of way, right? Um, but if you come to a different conclusion and you think music can create its own thought forms, that's totally fine. You, know? you can experiment, you can find your own find your own opinions on this and I always encourage you to do it, right? Um, but this is what it looks like, right? On the right here, this, it, it, this is the example that they painted, which I think is just really, really cool, right? It's very, very fun. Um, so do, 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 I think that is it. Yes, that is it for today. So let's go to a Q&A and discussion here because this is a very fun, uh, very fun class.